Good morning and blessed Advent. Today is Wednesday, December 13th, and you're listening to Thy Strong Word, where each weekday morning we explore the holy scriptures through which God bespeaks us righteous and nourishes our faith. I'm your host, Pastor Phil Boo of St. John Lutheran Church right here in Laverne, Minnesota. Just 11 days away until Christmas Eve, and we're counting down to Christmas by meditating on some of our most beloved Advent and Christmas hymns. This morning, we turn to page 361 in our Lutheran service books to the carol, O Little Town of Bethlehem. Speaking of hymnals, do you know who translates hymnals so that other people can enjoy these beautiful songs of faith? Why, it's the Lutheran Heritage Foundation. They help bring the true message of Christmas around the world through their translating and publishing work, and they are a sponsor of this show. So learn more about what they do on their website at lhfmissions.org. We're live this morning, so feel free to call in with your comments or questions. That number is 800-730-2727. You can also email them to me at pastorboo at gmail.com, or you can send me a message on Facebook. Now, that number I just gave, you're going to want to write that down because on Friday, I'll be inviting you to call in to win a set of Eternal Anthems, the story behind your favorite hymns. That two-volume set is from Concordia Publishing House, and you can win it just for listening to the program. So write that number down again, either to use it today or anytime, but especially this Friday when I ask for it, 800-730-2727. Well, this morning, I'm pleased to welcome a returning guest to the program, and that is the Reverend Dr. Curtis Dieterding. He's the pastor of Zion Lutheran Church in Fort Myers, Florida, and he's here to talk about O Little Town of Bethlehem. Good morning, brother, and welcome back to the show. Good morning. Can you hear me, brother? Yep. There you I are. Can. <laughs> Sorry about that. I was talking no, to myself there for a little bit. No worries. I have done that too. I've talked for myself and then I get a call from the <laughs> station saying, hey, you know, you're not on the air. So I'm glad it, does, it doesn't just happen to me. Well, brother, welcome back to the program. It is Advent. I know you're busy. I'm so thankful that you've taken the time to be with us this morning to talk about uh, old little town of Bethlehem. Uh, how is your Advent and Christmas season going down there at Zion? It's going very well. Um, we've, uh, you know, it's that time of the year when we get a lot of visitors uh, because uh, those who are a little tired of the cold and the snow up north like to come down and <laughs> thaw out for a little bit before they go back up and refreeze. So it's uh, it's always fun uh, to be part of the ministry here during this time of the year because of that. And, of course, our biggest uh, snowbird time of the year would be January through April, even May. So um, that's just on the horizon. And uh, we get a lot of families that come down to visit Grandpa and Grandma down here, as a lot of retired folks live here in southwest Florida. Oh, well, that's kind of fun. Now, you don't get the snow or the cold, probably not a white Christmas at Fort, in Fort Myers. Um, yeah, we're, we're complaining about the, uh, the, the the highs right now are in the mid to upper 70s. Oh. That's as, as, <laughs> as cold compared to what we've normally had. So, Well, that's that's something I definitely can't relate to at all. We, I think we're about 15 degrees today. But mm-hmm. uh, I tell you what, I, I've been asking all – we're doing a special, you know, here looking at the different Christmas hymns according to the scriptures and talking about their histories. But I've been asking all the guests, and I'd like to ask you, do you have a favorite Christmas hymn or carol or even an Advent hymn? Oh, goodness. You know, that's you, – yeah, you're catching me off guard. I hadn't been listening here lately, so I didn't know you were asking that question. Oh, no. Um, uh, yeah, I mean, Joy to the World is always good. Silent Night, uh, you know, the big ones, Way in a Manger, and this one, actually, A Little Town of Bethlehem. Is, and in fact, it's touching It's touching my heart a little bit more now that I've had a little bit more time studying a, a bit more about the history mm-hmm. and the background of this. So, yeah, well, that's I, I what really... I've... Oh, sorry, I didn't mean to interject. I was just going to say, that's what I've been finding, too. As, as I have these mm-hmm. guests on and I do my own little study and I hear what you guys have to say, it, it's making me... I guess have a new appreciation for these hymns. Some of when some of them I don't really like that much, but now I kind of like, oh, I even if it's not my favorite, I really I really love what it's trying to teach us. And and this is one of those. Mhm. Yeah, I I mean 
I can't, it's hard to nail down a favorite when it comes to <laughs> hymns. I mean, there's so many good ones. Sure. But, well, I tell you what, why don't we uh, go right into it? We're going to talk about the history. I look forward to seeing what you've uncovered. Uh, but before we even do that, go ahead and lead us in a word of prayer. Gracious Lord, we come before you this day asking that your spirit would be with us as as he always is through your word. We know that your word speaks even through hymns. And we know it, it, it happens again even in the hymn that we're studying this day. We pray that you would uh, bless us in our time uh, together, that we might uh, truly have a greater appreciation of all the hymns that are so rich within our churches that we sing each and every Advent and Christmas. May we be blessed again this day as we hear uh, the background of yet one more hymn uh, that of, of one who was really touched by not just the story of the birth of Jesus, but also uh, touched by his own life experiences. Bless us and help us to grow in our faith in Christ Jesus, who is the Prince of Peace. Amen. Amen. Okay, let us look at it then. So I have the author as Phillips, uh, sorry, Bro Phillips Brooks or Philip Brooks. Uh, what, what do you have here? Uh no, I have Phillips. It is Phillips with an Phillips. S. Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, as a, <laughs> as a Philip myself, I was thrown off by that, and I didn't know if that was like a, a typo or what, but uh, he was a um, – uh, not an Anglican, but the, the other kind. Uh, the, yeah. Yeah, he was, he was um, Episcopalian. Episcopalian, right. Mm -hmm. So tell us a little bit about the story behind it. I know that it involves a trip to the Holy Land. Yeah, it does, and that's that's what kind of uh, it was kind of a touch uh, touchstone for me. Um, I have to say that uh, you know Phillips Brooks, as he was growing up, didn't think too highly of himself when it came to education, uh, but he sold himself short. Really, uh, he tried to teach Latin at a, at a certain point in his life and um, failed miserably at it, and so he kind of was like, yeah. I'm not sure what I'm destined for, uh, but he does eventually uh, go off a, a, to the seminary. Uh, but let me let me just tell you a little bit about his childhood. So, um, uh, like you said, you know he was he was brought up in the Episcopalian uh, denomination. Uh, he was thought of as coming from a very pious family uh, there in New England, and. Uh, he eventually becomes uh, one of the greatest preachers of his day. But uh, what was interesting, what I found very interesting is that every Sunday at their, in their house, uh, the Brooks boys, because they were all boys, the, uh, the children, were required to memorize a hymn. And uh, their father at night, on Sunday nights, uh, would actually conduct the evening devotion. They would have devotion every Sunday night on the Lord's Day, and the children were, were basically given homework <laughs> to prepare for that devotion. Wow. They were to recite hymns. And so, um, you know, re reciting hymns all of his life, and I mean hundreds of hymns that he had memorized at one time, he could actually on a dime out of about 200 hymns from memory, he could just, uh, he could tell you what the words were. So, I mean, he, he definitely wasn't any kind of a dummy when it came to the retention level that he had uh, when it came to uh, reciting hymns, which obviously um, it had um, catapulted him into writing hymns himself. You know, it right. gave him all that background. He, he learned styles and ways in which to write. And, and of course, that, that influenced him and uh, it made him a poet. Actually, mm -hmm. his whole childhood training of, of memorizing and so forth, and and also, as I'm reading, I realize that this is what moved him to want to either teach, or be a preacher, um, because it moved him along uh, through the educational process in his Christian faith in his uh, denomination, and um, in fact, three of his brothers also became pastors as well. 
Well, and it's not uncommon for pastors of that era to to write a, an occasional hymn every now mm-hmm. and then. So that was probably something that was expected of pastors to do on occasion. Have you have you ever written a hymn? I know I have not, but have you ever done that? I have. I've written uh, a number of hymns actually, but I did it. I did most of them when I was younger because them to. Um, either a sermon series that I was doing, like walking through a gospel or whatever, or Mm -hmm. the Lord's Prayer, or just whatever the theme or the topic was of whatever series I was doing. And so I did did a lot of that. Um, Did some actually, I was actually taught that in high school, back in the days of of going to St. Paul's Lutheran High School in Concordia, Missouri. All the students that went there had to take uh, a certain number of courses in piano, in music theory, and in writing music. So, I mean, we even did some of that as well. Um, some of my favorite classes, actually. But uh, I grew up with a real love for poetry because uh, I had a teacher in fifth grade that had us write poems. And uh, she shot, showed us different styles of writing and really got interested anyway in doing that. So, yeah, I've... I've never had any actually make a hymnal, <laughs> but <laughs> but I've not ever submitted them either. So I don't know how they would stand in the in the face of all these greats. You know, there's there's some wonderful hymns, especially this one here. Just uh, the way it was put together is just absolutely beautiful. Well, I'd like to imagine that you know, for every amazing hymn that just sort of stands the test of time. They're probably a bunch of duds too, or or maybe better said, ones that served the moment but didn't really, you know, continue in perpetuity. And, and so this hymn, what I learned from reading a little bit on the internet, is that uh, he wrote it for his Sunday school children. Uh, and I yes. thought that part was interesting. Like it was a Sunday school hymn that put on a little brochure and then handed out. I, I don't know in the moment that he. I mean, I, I know it probably in the moment he wasn't thinking this is going to be one of these eternal classics. He's just writing it for his kids because, well, he wants them to know about Jesus. Yes, mm-hmm, exactly. So, yeah, he was uh, – oh, he, I was just trying to think of where he was in that time. I think he was um, – I know he had, a, he had a church, and he actually had an organist that he worked with. Uh, when it came to the Sunday school, and he served a Sunday school soup. Uh, this organist did, uh, Lewis Redner, and Brooks uh, asked Redner if he would write a, a, a suitable tune for the words of some of the things that he came up with. And so, um, especially for this particular one, this this particular hymn, um, the story as I have read it, Brooks asked Redner to write a tune for the words of O Little Town of Bethlehem. And um, he kind of, he kind of put, he was a procrastinator. <laughs> he, didn't, <laughs> he didn't have it ready. Um, he actually went to bed on Christmas Eve and uh, had not written the tune yet. And, and, the, and the, I guess the story goes, I don't know if it's a legend or not, but in the middle of the night, he, he had dreamed that he'd actually heard angels. And so he woke up and, uh, and he had that melody still kind of ringing in his ears. And so he seized the moment and he jotted it down. <laughs> the next morning, when he woke up really early before the service yet, uh, he <laughs> filled in the harmony. <laughs> it was like, wow, really? How did he do that? That's amazing. And of course, uh, you know, he, he says that it was God, you know, using angels to speak through him and, and, and give him that, that tune for this sure. particular hymn. So. Well, I, I have to admit, there's been one or two occasions in my ministry history where I've, uh, you know, it's been Saturday night pretty late, and you're starting <laughs> on a sermon for whatever reason. And uh, I certainly wouldn't uh, uh, turn down any help from angels in dreams. But <laughs> That's yeah. right. That's yeah, right. You, you never know. But you know what? Uh, what is fascinating, though, is talking about that particular uh, – what do we call it? Superintendents, you know, the guy who wrote the tune. From what I read, uh, this Lewis H. Redner was a wealthy real estate broker. And mm-hmm. uh, that he, uh, according to this article I read uh, from the United Methodist Church, it says that he increased Sunday school attendance at Holy Trinity Episcopal Church right there in Philadelphia, which is the church where uh, the author Phillips uh, served. 
Uh, yeah. But anyway, where he was the rector. But anyway, it went from 36 to over a thousand kids in his 19 years as superintendent. Well, now, I'm I did, sure he I did would not give, read that. <laughs> yeah, I'm sure he would give all glory to God. But if that's true, then that I couldn't imagine a thousand kids in Sunday school. That's pretty wild. Um, so no wonder he was a little busy to not get around to writing the tune to this hymn until the last minute. You think? But Yeah, exactly. Um, I do have a quote here. So according to the story, Brooks traveled on horseback between Jerusalem and Bethlehem on Christmas Eve, that night when it was inspiring or being inspired, I suppose, to write these lyrics. And, and this is just a quote from him. He says, before dark, we rode out of town to the field where they say the shepherd saw the star. It is a fenced piece of ground with a cave in it in which, strangely enough, they put the shepherds. Somewhere in those fields we rode through, the shepherds must have been. And as we passed, the shepherds were still keeping watch over their flocks or leading them home to fold. He was really impacted, as you said earlier, not just by the story of Jesus, but by being in the place where it happened. I, I've never been to the Holy Land Right now, they're, you know, they're a little busy. <laughs> I don't know that mm-hmm. I would go, mm-hmm. but I, I certainly hope it's not all rubble before I get to go. Yeah, that's, you know, I, I, I did read a little bit of history on that trip that he took over there to the Holy Land. And uh, I have actually been over there a couple of times and uh, we're in those hills that he's referring to there outside of Bethlehem. I don't know if they were the same hills that we saw, but it was it right. definitely were hills outside of Bethlehem. Um, where they had claimed that the shepherds probably were uh, actually t- taking care of their sheep. And what was pretty amazing is that when we went out there on our way out, we saw actually shepherds with sheep all along the hills. Um, so it's still that way even to this very day wow. um, that they're still doing that. And it just made it even more uh, more realistic you know, in our minds and in our hearts as we saw that. But to think now that this man has actually been in these hills in such a position as to actually, according to what I was reading, he could actually see the town of Bethlehem. Um, I don't recall that because we weren't there at night as he was. Mm. Uh, in fact, uh, it, it also had uh, informed me that he, that very night, um, attended the midnight services at the Church of the Nativity in Bethlehem. And so he actually, uh, you know, had the experience of uh, being able to worship there in that uh, famous church back in the day. Oh, wow. Well, did you find out anything else that you want to cover before we move into the actual lyrics of the text? Another interesting point is that Phillips Brooks um, never had a family of his own. Hmm. Uh, He had a very deep love for children, um, and you you definitely would have to to have a Sunday school at large, too. But he also wrote a lot of Christmas carols uh, specifically for his children, uh, for the children there of of the uh, Sunday schools, as as we heard earlier. And he not only wrote Christmas carols, but he also wrote Easter carols as well. So, I mean, he wrote uh, really thousands of carols throughout um, he was also known, and I, I just want to just kind of p- plug this here on the end, because I it did get into a little bit of the fact that there was some controversy there where he was a pastor. Uh, he grew up as a New England Puritan, um, and as he uh, grew up, uh, the New England Puritanism actually grew more and more radical over time, and until... Even the deity of Christ was denied, it said. Mm. And uh, so at the age of 34, when he began preaching there at the Trinity Church in Boston, he began preaching Christ crucified and presenting him in a whole new wonderful light. And and crowds began to fill the church. I'm sure this is where all these children came from as well. And uh, that was really the, the beginning of a very, uh, very long and... and uh, Blessed ministry of, of Phillips Brooks there in Boston, and a ministry that made him really famous uh, even to this day in history. So, yeah, he was eventually later uh, elevated to a bishopric also in his church uh, until his death of in 1893. So, wow, yeah, that is interesting. interesting. 
Yeah. Well, and there is an omitted verse. Did you stumble across that? Because, um, you know, we have four verses in our hymnal and there is one verse that is, well, it caused a little controversy for him too back then. Um, and it's since been omitted, but I, I'll go ahead and tell you the words. Here they are. Where yeah, mine, children... mine, mine does not show a fifth one. Mine does not show a fifth verse, no. Sure. So here's the fifth verse that's been removed. Where children pure and happy pray to the blessed child, where misery cries out to the son of the undefiled, where charity stands watching and faith holds wide the door, the dark night wakes the glory hearts and Christmas comes once more. What was, for those who didn't pick it up, I'm sure our guest did, what was sort of uh, controversial about that is the phrase, son of the undefiled. Um, he changed that later to the mother mild because people were accusing him of promoting immaculate conception, that doctrine that mm -hmm, states mm -hmm. that Mary herself was without sin. So, yeah, so he says of the undefiled, and he changes it to Mother Mild, and then he just throws it out altogether. I'm sure there's more to the story than that, but <laughs> the, the four verses we've ended up with um, certainly I don't think cause any contention amongst people, but you never know. You never know. Mm -hmm. uh, well, let's, uh, let's get into it. I'm going to go ahead and read the very first stanza of our hymn, and I'll be reading from Lutheran Service Book, page or hymn 361. O little town of Bethlehem, how still we see thee lie. Above thy deep and dreamless sleep the silent stars go by. Yet in thy dark streets shineth the everlasting light, the hopes and fears of all the years are met in thee tonight. This is one of those hymns, carols that I remember so much from my childhood because that first passage, first stanza always stood out to me. Just just the concept of a deep and dreamless sleep and the the dark streets, but what's shining them in shining in them is Christ. It's just a beautiful imagery. Uh, take us through this. Where can we see these themes in scripture? Why is this such a good hymn? Well, I mean, he starts where you need to start with uh, this town of Bethlehem. I mean, we know that um, it was a prophecy that Messiah would be born in this town. Actually, uh, you have to, to go back to the old Testament book of Micah. Um, the second verse, and, I, and I'll just read that. Please. It says, But you, Bethlehem Ephrathah, though you are small among the clans of Judah, out of you will come for me one who will be ruled, whose origins are from of old, from ancient times. We've always uh, believed this verse to be a prophecy pointing to this very event that was going to take place in the town of Bethlehem. And we learn more that uh, about the connection also to King David, that that this baby was going to come from the line of the seed of David all the way down to uh, when, it, when the time for him was to be born. So you got, you know, in Luke uh, 2, 4 there, it's identifying Bethlehem as the city of David. Um, and and so there's really a couple of connections there then to Messiah, the one that's going to be called Christ. Um, and so there's a lot there's a lot here in this in this little town of Bethlehem. Um, I mean there's a lot of connection here. One of my favorite little, I guess, trivia pieces about Bethlehem is what it means in English. You know, the Hebrew Bethlehem, it mm -hmm. means house of bread. Mm -hmm. And I just, I love that. Uh, is it a coincidence? I don't know. Is it serendipitous? Is it God's planning from history? I don't know. But we have the very bread of life coming to us in a town called the house of bread being born in a manger where animals feed. And of course, we continue to feed on the flesh and blood of Jesus as he calls us to do in the sacrament. So we see that imagery coming mm -hmm. up. We also see what John loves, and that is this distinction between darkness and and light. And I always call upon John, but really the whole Bible is right. talking about how Christ or God is a light shining in the darkness. And even us, we're to be lights shining in the darkness. So uh, that, that phrase, though, above thy deep and dreamless sleep, the silent stars go by. 
dreamless sleep. I, I, I don't know offhand, but I'm just trying to think like what what could that imagery be evoking? I, you know, is that the idea that people are? I, I don't know. I guess I don't know. I could guess. But what do you think? I never really even thought about that. I I see that now, and now that you mention it, I'm I'm not sure. Yeah, I don't know I don't what know dreamless either. sleep would be. I, I, I dream guess all just, the time. Yeah, yeah. Oh well, good for you. I don't ever remember my dreams. I I, I guess I get just the sense of of dreamless, almost giving me the uh, the image of people who have been waiting for so long that they're just at the edge of they don't even dare to dream anymore. They don't even dare to hope that it's going to happen. And that's not a lack of faith situation. It's just the human condition. The whole people are in this deep sleep. It's dark. Um, you know, they, they we also think of sleep in terms of being unaware of what's going on around us. So perhaps they're complacent even uh, in the coming of Christ. But anyway, in the dark street shineth, though, an everlasting light. Uh, the hopes and fears of all the years are met in thee. The thee is Jesus. Jesus comes and he and he is God's answer to all that we hope for. And he's our he's the answer, the response to all of our fears. Uh, I, I know the Sunday school joke is that, you know, if you ask the kids a question, they think the answer is always Jesus. Well, in this case, it really is Jesus. Mm hmm. It is. And uh, yeah, so yeah, the light darkness is, is throughout. We can see that. Um, and then, of course, the the adjective um, everlasting light that and it's, uh, you know, that light is capitalized, knowing that that's pointing directly to Christ Jesus and the hopes and fears of all the years are met in thee tonight. So we've got, you know, we've got the the. Um, that image is is powerful too because uh, we're going to be attached to that image and and he actually touches on it a little bit later on so we can wait till we get to another verse for that but well sounds good i tell you what we're right here at the time for our break and it's a good time to take it so we're going to go ahead and take a break folks don't go anywhere pastor Dieter Ding and i will be back and we'll keep on going These are the voices of young Lutherans in Mexico City, children who are excited to learn more about their Savior, Jesus. But they need our help, because good Lutheran books for kids in the Spanish language are in short supply in Mexico. To learn how you can help tell Spanish-speaking kids everywhere about Jesus in a language they can understand, go to the Lutheran Heritage Foundation website at lhfmissions.org forward slash Juan 316. Welcome back, dear saints. I'm Pastor Phil Boo. I'm your host. With me this morning is the Reverend Dr. Curtis Dieter Ding, pastor of Zion Lutheran Church in Fort Myers, Florida. And this is Thy Strong Word. We're counting down to Christmas by contemplating Advent and Christmas hymns according to the scriptures. And today we are meditating on the hymn, O Little Town of Bethlehem. Now, before we head back into it and pick up with verse two or stanza two, I just want to remind you again that if you have any feedback or questions, comments or complaints, feel free to reach out to me. You can email me at pastorboo at gmail.com. You can find me on Facebook or you can call into the studio. Now, you're going to want to write this number down, 800 730 Two seven. Now, any of those methods can get your question or comment out on the air, but remembering that number is going to be your key because on this Friday's episode, December 17th, I'm giving away a set of volumes one and two of Eternal Anthems published by Concordia Publishing House. Now, this handsome two-volume set will help you discover the stories behind many of your favorite hymns. So head over to cph.org to learn more about these great resources, but don't forget, you can get them for free just by listening to Thy Strong Word. At least you can if you're the one who calls in when I ask for you to call. I'll be giving it away on Friday. So listen for details. Now, Pastor, before the break, we were just getting into our hymn, and now we're going to move into stanza two. 
For Christ is born of Mary, and gathered all above while mortals sleep, the angels keep their watch of wondering love. O morning stars, together proclaim the holy birth, and praises sing to God the King, and peace to men on earth. That's uh, not the version out of our hymnal. I read it from my notes. Let's uh, read the version from our hymnal. So it's, it's a little, it's a little different. For Christ is born of Mary and gathered all above. While mortals sleep, the angels keep their watch of wondering love. O morning stars, together proclaim the holy birth and praises sing to God the King and peace to all the earth. So little difference in these two different styles, but it's pretty much coming from the same author. Just some different emphases. Take us through this second stanza. Well, just uh, right there at the very start, um, you know, it, it's telling the story now of actually Christ's uh, birth, you know. In Luke chapter 1, and it's a, it's a, long, uh, it's a long passage there about uh, Mary and being the mother of, of Jesus, um, verse. Uh, but I just I just want to read just a couple of those pieces, just so we can uh, get a, uh, a a feel for what might have been going on in his head as he's writing this hymn. Um, it, it says, uh, in the sixth month of Elizabeth's pregnancy, God sent an angel Gabriel to Nazareth, a town in Galilee, to a virgin pledged to be married to a man named Joseph, a descendant of David. This virgin's name was Mary. Then the angel went to her and said, Greetings, you who are highly favored. The Lord is with you. And Mary was greatly troubled by his words and, and so forth and so, so on. And we, and we discovered that um, he does say to her, do, you, do not be afraid, Mary. You found favor with God. You will conceive and give birth to a son. And you are to call him Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High, the Lord God will give him the throne of his father, David. And this is what we were kind of referring to there in that, uh, in the whole understanding of Bethlehem. Um, so I like, I like what is, is uh, said here in that second phrase, though. It says, for Christ is born of Mary and gathered all above. Um, you, you, you can feel that it's talking about the heavenly hosts, the angels, the mortals, all are watching and, and, and uh, seeing this this wonderful moment in history in the history of God's world, um, and and I like their watch of wondering love. You know, this is the beginning of the love that God is going to show to us, uh, and in fact, it shows that God loves us to the point of sending His only Son. And so, there's a lot that's really uh, attached to this particular section here too. Well, I just, before we went on the air, I had a little chapel session with the preschoolers at my congregation, and we were talking about this very thing of, you know, the angels above keeping their watch. And of course, when they proclaim the coming of Christ to the shepherds. Uh, but yeah, we have this beautiful imagery that God is in control of his creation. These things are not just happening by accident. They're fulfilling scripture. And so there's this emphasis of, of Christ being born of Mary, which I think highlights his incarnational nature, right? He is born man. Uh, and I think that is so scandalous, at least it was, for so long. But today we just take for granted the scandalon of what's happening. But when this occurred, a lot of the reasons why people were hesitant to receive Christ – is because of that very first phrase, for Christ is born of Mary. They anticipated that he would be this human ruler, but they never anticipated that that was God himself. Mm -hmm. Yeah, being over, you know, being overshadowed, as, as we have heard it in the scripture, by the Holy Spirit. You know, it's God and man, true God, true man, all at the same time. 100% as we say you know he's always both and uh, another thing another passage that comes to mind is that that what's being said here in this in this particular verse is uh, really the fulfillment again of it's speaking to, to the fulfillment of this passage from Isaiah 9 uh, the people walking in darkness have seen a great light on those living in the land of deep darkness a light has come and then later on in that in verse six for us, for to us a child is born to us a son is given and the government will be on his shoulders and he'll be called wonderful 
Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, and here it is, Prince of Peace. And he's got a peace to men on earth, we know is actually uh, the way in which um, the angels spoke to the shepherds in the field, too, the way that, that ends there. And that all praise, of course, needs to be given to God and uh, proclaimed about this this birth, this holy birth that um, that he's referring to here in this carol. In the older translation I found of stanza two, it says it ends with, and peace to men on earth. And in our version, it says, and peace to all the earth. And I understand how language can be a little antiquated and of, you know, maybe people take exception to men not understanding that it stands for mankind. But let's talk about that in general. So when the angels come to the shepherds and they announce peace on earth with those with whom God is well pleased or something to that effect, I'm Mm -hmm. paraphrasing, Mm -hmm. it, it never really says in the Bible that it's peace on earth to all men because there is peace is offered for sure, but... Peace doesn't end up coming to all men. Isn't that right? We sometimes struggle with the idea that Christ is the prince of peace, but it's the same Christ who came and said, I've come to not bring peace but a sword. How do we understand that in the context of Christmas? Well, the peace that that comes from above is is different from the peace that we uh, experience in this world. It's It's a peace that... Um, even Paul says, passes our understanding, our own human understanding. Uh, it's a peace that's eternal. It's, it's, it's forever peace. And um, so that makes it, it makes it very different. And we also know that not everyone is going to experience that eternal peace because of the fact that um, you need to be able to embrace it through faith, all of what God has done. Uh, in keeping his promise of bringing salvation. I mean, the, the name Jesus itself is uh, a name that actually means he saves or, or, or save, saves us from our sins, as it says in Matthew. So, um, yeah, there's a lot here that, that uh, you're asking in that question. I mean, it's a, there's a lot to that. Well, there really is, and I, I think a lot of people struggle with this idea because of just what you uh, intimated, that, that Christ's coming doesn't bring peace among men or between men or mankind or human beings, although he offers that, right, because those who walk with Christ are walking in peace with one another. But he also has to reflect on this idea that his coming is going to really divide us because some people are going to reject him. It's just a fact. But, yeah, that peace and reconciliation that we celebrate – is the peace that he offers us with God, right? So we, we always think about the, the conflict we have with one another, but what about the conflict, the chasm between us and God? That needs to be bridged. And so Christ's coming brings peace because now through him, we've been reconciled to God. Yeah, it's this beautiful message that we have. Yeah, and he brings it to everyone. Not, right. not, every, not everyone believes it. So, you know, there's going to be those who will reject this gift of the peace that he brings. And uh, it's the same with the salvation. You know, Christ died on the cross for the sins of everyone, for every single person that ever lived on the face of God's earth. But uh, not everyone is going to receive uh, the gifts that Christ brings. Um, you know, it's like if, if I were to uh, offer you a gift and uh, you... Uh, don't receive the gift. You just turn and walk away from that gift and reject me. <laughs> um, the gift is still there, and it's still, I'm still right. going to be offering it to you. Uh, it's, up, it's, it's up to you whether or not um, that this gift will be yours and whether or not the, the power of the Holy Spirit is at work in your life, giving you another gift, which is the gift of faith that actually receives the, gift, the gifts that Christ brings. That's right. We don't have the capabilities, according to the scriptures, to seek out God or accept him as our savior, or however some of our other friends like to describe it. But Mm -hmm. we certainly can reject him, and so many people do. Let's move on to stanza three. Let me read it from the hymnal so we don't get any odd phrasing. Here we go. How silently, how silently the wondrous gift is given. So God imparts to human hearts the blessings of his heaven. No ear may hear his coming, but in this world of sin, where meek souls will receive him, still the dear Christ enters in. 
All right. So we have more of this silent night kind of language, but we have a pointing to the wondrous gift and a little bit of God imparting to human hearts. So sounds like uh, imputed righteousness, imparted righteousness. How are we stand on that? <laughs> Take us through this one. Um, yeah, I think we were I think we were touching on that already. Um, I, my mind was wandering somewhere else while you were talking to me there. I just I was happens. looking at how you read that last those last uh, phrases there because I didn't remember singing them that way either. But it, you, you had said, "Where meek souls will receive him, still the dear Christ enters in." In 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 another um, in another uh, poetic, uh, I don't know how you put it. The uh, the way in which it's written on the sheet is where meek souls will receive him still. And then it ends with the dear Christ enters in. In other words, where meek souls will receive him. Um, and, and still, in other words, that these people that believe is the way I understood that part. But so, I, yeah, just so, to, just to speak to that. So yeah. in the LSB, and that's where I'm reading it from, right. where mm -hmm. meek souls will receive him, comma, still, the dear Christ enters in. So I don't know. I don't know what to make of that. But um, where meek souls will receive him, it's still that receiving language, though. I don't think we Lutherans would take exception to that, um, you know, because we do receive Christ. It's just not something we initiate. Um, still, the dear Christ enters in. Receive him still. Yeah, that's interesting. I don't know what to make of that either. It's interesting that the comma was put where it was, is I guess what I'm trying to say. I'm not yeah, sure absolutely. why it wasn't put behind still, because that's the way I remember singing it growing up. Is what Another I'm version I have has places the comma after still. So, yeah, well, I, I, I'm with you. I'm with you. I'm actually going to go so far as to say it might be a typo in the LSB. Yeah, because I'm not, I'm not sure we that they a, meant it that way. Yeah. So that was just interesting what you were it in. <laughs> So. Okay, let's go back. Let's go back to. Uh, can you can you recall the question that you had asked me earlier? Can you walk us through that again? I'd really appreciate that. Uh, no. <laughs> <laughs> Well, yeah, I would have, have really appreciated it. <laughs> I, well, yeah, I make this stuff up as, as I go, folks. I, I have no idea what I said. I'd have to rewind the tape. Why don't well, I just I read it again and we'll start it? We'll start it over like we know what we're doing. Uh, yeah. uh, how silently, silently, the wondrous gift is given. So God imparts to human hearts the blessings of His heaven. No ear may hear His coming, but in this world of sin, where meek souls will receive Him still, the dear Christ enters in. Uh, by the way, in the LSB, the is capitalized. I don't know if that's just how you do it, but anyway. Mm -hmm. All right, so uh, let's look at that. So silent, silent night. I was just talking about probably how uh, it gives us this beautiful imagery that we get kind of in, in silent night. But it focuses on the giving of a gift. And then now I remember my question. There it gets go. to the second part and it says, God imparts to human hearts the blessings of his heaven. And it recalled in my brain sort of the, the the debate between imparted righteousness and imputed righteousness. But you can take it in whatever direction you want. Okay. Well, I have to work with those larger theological words here. Now, so. <laughs> uh, so anyway, um, you know, what came to mind for me is the fact that we know that God is the one who uh, brings us to faith and probably – there probably doesn't come any clearer than, you know, when it talks about uh, how we come to faith through the work of God and through his word. Um, you know, like Romans 10 in Romans. So we, we recall, you know, how it says, how then can they call on the one whom they have not believed in? And how can they believe in the one they've not heard um, of whom they have not heard, I should say. And, you know, how can they hear without someone preaching to them? And it goes on and it says, consequently, faith comes from hearing the message and the message is heard through the word of Christ. Um, so it, it's really important. It's, it's, I just found it kind of interesting because it goes on to say uh, from there, you know, it comes from hearing. And I found it kind of interesting that it says no, may, no ear may hear his coming, but the ear hears God's word. You know, it's just kind of interesting. right. That what I like about this verse is that you know there wasn't a lot of fanfare in this coming of Christ. 
Hmm. The game is very silent. It's very, it's 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 wondrous. It's no ear may hear is coming. I'm thinking in terms of it's he came very quietly into this world, very humble. Got a humble nature. Just this whole verse about how Christ came into this world and what he was about to do, um, and that's you know um, that he was going to come and conquer sin, death, and the devil, and uh, you know. That, that people will receive him uh, as Messiah, as Christ. Yeah, and, I, and I'm thinking of Galatians 4. But when the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his son, born of a woman, born under the law. Mm-hmm. So we have this idea that he comes, he's born under the law in the sense that, you know, he keeps the law perfectly on our behalf. And then I, I, I take it to Ephesians, uh, Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith that you being rooted and grounded in love. So these are just little sort of excerpts that I was writing down as I was reading it. But this comes to my mind, too, because, yes, he comes into this world of sin where law is required, but we receive him and he enters in. Now, now this language of Christ entering into our hearts is a poetic language. Of course, it's it's not some sort of literal residing within the cockles of our cardiac muscle. But at the same time, we have this indwelling of Christ in us in such a way that his coming isn't just something that happens in the past, but it affects us now. Mm -hmm. The meekness of souls receive him. That is people who don't think that they can just do it on their own. People who don't want to stand before Mm -hmm. God on their own merits, who recognize we need salvation. And for those people, which really everybody should recognize that for those people christ is there for you i I just that's so comforting to me yeah a few a few verses that kind of dip back into verse one a little bit and then kind of comes into this receiving him uh thought you know where where meek souls will receive him uh reminds me of of john chapter one beginning at verse nine the true light that gives light to everyone was coming into the world he was in the world and Though the world was made through him, the world did not recognize him. He came to that which was his own, but his own did not receive him. Yet to all who did receive him, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become the children of God. Mm. And I just I just love that because it, it pulls it all the way to that, that very popular verse, you know, the word became flesh and made his yeah. dwelling among us, seen well, his glory the glory of the one and only son who came from the father full of grace and truth. So, I mean, this is the one that we're talking about here. This Christ, this, this whole song is about, uh, you know, Christ is born of Mary. Uh, Christ is the one who needs to enter into our lives, into our hearts to be received. Uh, All the gifts that he brings, this wondrous gift brings so many other gifts as well. So, yeah, it's just it's just it's packed. It really is. It is. It's it did is. a great job writing this hymn. Well, and I especially like uh, a stanza four, probably my favorite, because and of course it all builds on each other. But the reason why is we have verses or stanzas one, two, and three, and they, and they they talk about what's going on in history, right? Silent nights, um, you know, deep in and silent stars, deep sleeps, dark streets, all that good stuff. Born mm-hmm. to Mary, but then. Stanza four is the with them factor, the what's in it for me factor, right? Like, like, okay, great. Jesus came. So what? Well, here we have the so what? I'm going to read stanza four. Oh, holy child of Bethlehem, descend to us, we pray. Cast out our sin and enter in, be born in us today. We hear the Christmas angels, the great glad tidings tell. Oh, come to us, abide with us, our Lord, Emmanuel. And Emmanuel, of course, means God with us. Yeah, this Mm -hmm. guy knows what he's doing when he's writing hymns. But Mm -hmm. in any case, yeah, we have this language of this isn't just something that's happened in the past, a curiosity, something we measure our time by, right? Right now it is 2023 in the CE, right? The Christian Mm -hmm. era. (laughs) <laughs> mm-hmm. or yep. AD as we used to say mm-hmm. it. But, right. but we all measure time based on his coming, but it didn't just stop there. It, you know, now be born in us, come to us, abide with us. Mm-hmm. I just love it. It's a, it's a prayer to Christ. Right. 
So, yeah, and, and uh, you know, our believer's prayer <laughs> is actually found in the Bible, Romans 10. And I, this is what came to mind. Again, you know, there's, there, I have so many passages written around every one of these verses that just came to mind. It's just incredible. But I, I think of these passages from uh, Romans 10, beginning in verse 9, if you declare with your mouth, Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For it is with your heart that you believe and are justified, and it is with your mouth that you profess your faith and are saved. And so, you know, I look at this, and that's how we are born again. I, mean, we, I can't help but think about how Christ talks about being born uh, in him in the sense of in, in, in God's kingdom through baptism. You know, when I hear that word born, I know born in us, uh, one way he's born in us is through faith and baptism. Um, and that's what we look for when it comes to this this holy child, that he's also in our hearts. He's not just in the manger and in history. He's actually in our lives and in our hearts. Absolutely. Absolutely. It's, it is a, a beautiful hymn. I think it's great. I hope people enjoy singing it. I hope that uh, folks take away from our conversation a little deeper understanding of just what you are singing about when you sing mm -hmm. this hymn. Absolutely. Uh, well, we're here at the end of the program. Any final comments or thoughts for the folks before we go? Yeah, I just, I, I just remember being there in the Holy Land myself. This is why this was so touching for me, to be able to uh, hear how he pulls it all together of what that night was must have been like and what the purpose of this one who is coming so that's that is woven throughout you know this entire hymn uh the very purpose why he's coming and that the and that we uh need to receive this this child uh not just like i said in history or just as uh one that had the name jesus and he was born a long time ago but that he's truly your savior he's truly the christ he's truly the one who has fulfilled uh all and he has come in such a humble fashion in a humble town. Uh, Bethlehem was not a big metropolis either in the day. And so, um, yeah, I hope we can take that all away from this hymn. Well, I tell you what, I'd like to thank my guest this morning, the Reverend Dr. Curtis Dieterding, pastor of Zion Lutheran Church in Fort Myers, Florida. Thanks, brother, for being on the show and taking us through this great hymn. And this was the first time that I've, I've actually been on the program uh, without uh, actually entering into the scripture, um, <laughs> but coming into a song. And I, I just I really enjoyed today. So thank you. Thank you. It's been great. I've really enjoyed this series, and I hope you guys at home are, have been enjoying it, too. You know, there's tons of scripture to be found in our hymns, and that's the very mm -hmm. reason why I'm doing this. Now, tomorrow, we're going to be joined by the Reverend George Ruish. He's pastor of Grace Lutheran Church in Nashua, New Hampshire, and we'll be turning in our hymnals to 363, Silent Night, Holy Night. So to be sure to catch that. But until then, may God's peace and blessings be with you all as we pray, Father, keep us in thy strong word. <laughs>